documenting. So it's our pleasure to have Gunnar Carson today, and he will tell us about deep learning and TDA. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm really glad this meeting is, is, is going on. Uh, it's an exciting bunch of uh, talks. Uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to talk about today uh, is some work that we've been doing over the last couple of years in studying um, the behavior of deep neural networks um, uh, using information gleaned from uh, topological data analysis and also uh, to be able to say, um, uh, you, you know, how might we improve things? Uh, how, how might we improve um, deep learning methods using insights from TDA? So let's see here. So, so what is deep learning? It's a methodology based on neural networks. Uh, neural networks are directed graphs that define uh, computations. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. It, but uh, the, the key thing is it's produced outstanding. I would say sometimes things I would have regarded as miraculous uh, classification results for uh, complex data types, um, such as images, um, text, uh, and molecules. So with images, for example, you can take a data set consisting of images, uh, say, of handwritten digits, uh, called MNIST, that would be one, um, and uh, classify the, the, the digits uh, extremely accurately. So classify which one, which one it is. Um, there are, however, so the results, as I say, are spectacular. Um, there are some problems, though. The first problem is adversarial examples. So if you think about the AI that's needed for autonomous vehicles, um, you, you know, one of the things that's needed there is the ability to read speed limit signs. Um, and uh, so in a, in a recent uh, example or a recent thing that happened was that um, there was a speed limit sign that was supposed to be a 35. But the central prong in the three was a little bit too long. And so the AI that had learned to read exact uh, speed limit signs missed it and read it as an 85, which is an obvious uh, problem here with uh, uh, that one can't have. It's a general lack of transparency. So, um, uh, you know, that it's hard to know what's going on inside the neural network. Uh, one sort of knows, sees that one gets good results coming out, but one doesn't know how it works. And that's uh, really a problem in many key domains. So <clears throat> particularly the regulated ones. So think about financial uh, you know, regulation, healthcare, and so on. If you don't understand what the computation is doing, uh, that's really problematic. And we'd like to be able to learn maybe more complex models than just classifiers. So neural networks uh, are a method that is sort of motivated by one's understanding of uh, you know, the behavior of the human or mammalian uh, nervous system. Uh, so they that system performs computations in, in a sense, um, and it does so using a collection of neurons and then a collection of uh, edges between neurons uh, and uh, where the effect on a given neuron is determined not only by its, where it itself is, but also by its neighbors using some kind of you know, formula or, or, or some kind of process. And so that's the thinking that computation should be done in that same way. So here's an example. Uh, this is a so-called feed-forward neural network. In this case, uh, and, and it's called fully connected, uh, because what you'll notice is that it's divided up into layers. Uh, so this is, it's a directed graph. They have the layers uh, there's an input layer, which is where you actually have your, um, the, the input from the data set. There are the two hidden layers which perform the computations. And then the third is an output layer, which is an answer to some question that you have about your data. So think of the input layer, for example, as being the images in this MNIST data set. And the output layer would then be a digit between zero and nine. Uh, now, the, the, these hidden layers are neurons, uh, are thought of as neurons. And uh, you'll notice that if I take, for example, oops, sorry. If I take, for example, this node up here, uh, it is a node which is going to receive or going to compute something. And what it's going to compute is a formula of the, these three nodes, which are the three nodes that connect to it. So the formula is often some, you know, there are various ways one can do that formula, but it should be symmetric in the, um, you, you know, in the neurons. And importantly, each edge has attached to it a weight, so uh, which is a number. And so the formula actually depends on the weights on the edges coming in together with the values, or the activations at the nodes that, 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 uh, that are at the tail of those edges. Um, those weights 
uh, are things that that's what's what's being allowed to vary here. And, and so um, uh, I, I attempt to optimize the computation uh, or optimize for uh, performing, uh, you know, the prediction or the classification or whatever by choosing um, via an optimization algorithm uh, the weights on these edges. And uh, similarly here in um, uh, in hidden layer two, the same thing happens. Each node there is connected to every node in the preceding layer, and so that's the computation that you get. So this is a, a this is a computation graph. One should think of the weights as somehow coefficients in a formula, um, and, but the formula is quite large. And you know, for the real neural, I mean, this is a small toy example. For the real one, it's much worse. Okay, so anyway, this is kind of a summary of what I just said. So, um, you know, you, you have these, uh, uh, the, the weights being assigned to the directed edges. Uh, the network is trained by an optimization algorithm. The optimization algorithm is a form of gradient descent uh, acting on a set of weights. Okay, so what I showed you was what I would call a fully connected uh, feed forward neural network. It was fully connected in that every node in a given layer was connected to every node in the preceding layer. Now, you might want to, if you do that, you get very, very large networks, which are very hard to compute with um, fairly soon. Um, but not only that, it is also that you might want to guide the learning in a certain, in a certain way. And, and, and so that's what's accomplished in, with what are called convolutional neural networks. Um, so I'm going to describe that for you here in a little bit. So, uh, so the structure of the network is adapted to specific cases. So when I, if I have images, for example, the structure of the network is going to be determined by the fact that the input comes in that 2D rectangular array. And similarly, text would be 1D arrays. Uh, where you, you have sentences which are, you know, have tokens in each one uh, for, for the words or a time series. So here's the convolutional neural network. And let me describe, there are two, two aspects to it. So you, you'll see here we have the layers, but notice that the layers are given as squares or rectangles. And so that we're going to make two restrictions on the connections now. We are not going to draw any connections between, say, an input node up in the upper left and the, in, the, in the next layer, a, a, a pixel in the lower right. In fact, what we're going to insist on is that each uh, pixel in, these, in the uh, first layer, in the, uh, in, that is to say, not the input layer, but the first layer is connected only to those input pixels, which are within a small box uh, around it. In fact, maybe even a three by three box. Uh, and so that's what I would call a locality condition. And that is, uh, that is building in the intuition that what we want to learn, we want to learn kind of local conditions. We don't believe that in these images there are going to be, uh, you know, huge connections between points that are very far apart. Now, this is appropriate for many things here, many natural images, the, the things that we're, we're talking about. But in, that's a condition that one might want to revisit at some point for, you know, some more exotic class of images. The second point, though, is the convolutional condition. So if you notice that the, that second layer there, the, the, the one labeled feature maps 20 by 20, uh, that uh, thing consists of several slices, each of which is a grid. And so the requirement that we want to, to build in here, or the, the, the thing that we want to have is that if I have a cat in the upper left-hand corner or a cat in the lower right-hand corner of the image, I'd like to recognize them the same way. And so the way that you do that is if you take that first slice, the one in, in front in the 20 by 20 feature maps thing, and I have a, you know, the, the weights for a pixel, uh, for, for, for a given pixel there coming in, then um, what I want to say is that if I take a different pixel and take its box coming back, the weights are going to be the same. So it's an equivariance or homogeneous, uh, homogeneity condition that says that actually I want to learn um, to distinguish objects independent of their position. So, of course, the weights can vary as I move from slice to slice, but within each slice, uh, they don't change. So here's a question uh, you might ask, what, what would we want to know about this? Well, we want to know, does the, learn, does the learning by CNNs behave like human learning? So this is joint work with my colleague uh, or my student, Rickard Gabrielson. So what do we want to know? 
we want to know, can we see similarities to what we found in image patch data? So I'll recall or, you know, or tell you briefly what we found in a statistical study of image patch data that we did some uh, 15 years ago. Um, we might ask what happens as the network learns and what, what are the responsibilities of the various layers? So I want to have ways of kind of addressing those questions, trying to understand them. So here is the study that we did, the description of a study that we did on a, on a data set of three by three patches in natural images. This data set came from David Mumford and his group uh, at, at Brown University. Um, and uh, it consisted of nine vectors, three by three patches, but the, only the high variance ones. So you don't want to include the patches that are in the middle of, of constant uh, regions of, of, of uh, intensity. It also studies only the densest such patches, so they're the most frequently occurring motifs. And we have particular uh, density proxies, and they are of varying locality. So when I say locality, that's varying, uh, like, for example, the sigma in a kernel density estimator, where you're, you're, you're asking, are you emphasizing um, uh, you know, points that are close to where you are or emphasizing you know, a broader range of points. And again, it's a simple proxy called, we call it codensity. It's just the distance to the kth nearest neighbor. So the parameter there is K and the, um, you know, the locality varies uh, inversely with that. So, uh, so this was motivated by understanding how the tuning of neurons in the visual cortex is affected by the statistics of natural images. And, and what we found was this, the, pri the a primary circle, um, uh, so this was the most dense thing using a, don, a non a local density measure. Um, you can see here that what it consists of is simply patches that are a gradient from black to white, uh, kind of a linear gradient, discretizations of such, um, and, uh, and then rotated around. So in other words, you might have that gradient moving at different angles. That angle is the circle parameter. Now we thought that what we would do is say, well, let's actually take a more local, more precise density estimator, and let's see if we get the same thing, which is what we thought we would get. But in fact, we found this. Uh, we found uh, a, a, a model that includes, yes, that primary circle, which is kind of the linear uh, thresholds or the linear, uh, the linear uh, um, uh, gradients. Um, but we also found two other uh, things of, of, of reasonable density. And so what you can see here is that those are transitions where I'm transitioning from, say, on the left there, a, you know, a vertical linear gradient to something which is, um, you know, instead, uh, you, you know, a line, a black line in the middle of a white region. And so that's, that's kind of an interesting transition that kind of, you, you know, in, in rough qualitative sense, this is actually transitioning from a linear to a pure quadratic. Uh, those, those things there, uh, you know, the lines in the middle of uh, a black line in the middle of a white region and a white line in the middle of a black region can be thought of as discretized uh, quadratics. Similarly, on the, on the right there, you've got your horizontal ones. You'll notice that the three things, um, uh, the, 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 well, the two secondary circles don't intersect each other, but both of them uh, intersect the primary circle in two points, as is kind of indicated by the coloring there. Okay, so that's an interesting uh, model. They, they, it turns out that when I glue the circles together like that, that has a Betty number, first Betty number of five. Uh, and in fact, with that's, that is how we, we found them. Um, and now you could ask, so can I take that three circle model and extend it, you know, relax the thresholding a little bit and hope to get a two-dimensional model. The answer is that you can, and you get uh, this object, you know, familiar object, a, a Klein model. You can see here that uh, the upper uh, edge and the lower edge uh, you get connected in a straightforward way without any kind of twisting. So, the, um, so for example, uh, let's see here, this, this point right here and this point are the same, uh, this point and this point are the same. On the other hand, here, this point and this point are the same. And so there's a twist there. So this is a Klein bottle. And you can see the red there is that primary circle that we saw before. And then the two yellow and green are the two secondary circles. OK, so um, now uh, the, uh, <clears throat> let me just remark what this has to do with, uh, you, you know, with neuroscience, if you like. So uh, the, the primary visual cortex is the lowest level processing unit beyond the retina. Um, there are higher levels that perform more abstract tasks uh, called V2, V4, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Work from 60 years ago uh, by Hubel and Wiesel 
show that individual neurons detect edges and lines. So this is so the edge being those primary circle things, which says, oh, that, there's a there's there are two sides, uh, you know, transitioning from white to black. And um, but there are also other neurons that detect that those the points on the secondary circles, the lines going at a certain angle between, you know, in the middle of a white region. So, you know, their finding was, oh, yes, uh, you know, individual neurons are, are tuned to both edges and lines. And what we're seeing is basically that Klein bottle is the small manifold that includes both the edges and the lines. So this is consistent with the idea of compression of frequently occurring signals, uh, because tuning an individual neuron to something rather than an array of neurons to something. If I tune an individual neuron, it says I must see that often because I want to capture it quickly and, and, and simply. And so the visual pathway here uh, consists uh, here of, you can see the, the, the retina is in, in front there. Uh, you, you pass it immediately to, to V1, uh, which I've got, has got the edges and lines in it. And then you have uh, the higher order, uh, you know, with, this, with bigger receptive fields, V2, V4, and IT, which capture more complex object types. So um, I'm going to show you some mapper pictures. I'll just remind you, I, I suspect people here are familiar with this, but uh, mapper is a way that we build um, uh, network models for data. So we apply a projection, one or more projections to the data set. Uh, here it's the y-coordinate, but normally it's something more statistically meaningful, uh, like density measures, like centrality measures, like linear uh, uh, you know, machine learning coordinates, like principal component analysis. So we use the projection to bin the data into overlapping bins, like this, and then we cluster each bin using a fixed clustering method. Or you, you could use whatever you, whatever you like. Uh, your, what, you know, whatever your uh, your heuristic is going to be for clustering. And so what that does for us is it builds now a collection of nodes. So you could say, well, this is a clustering, this is a collection of pieces. That's interesting, it's fine, but let's remember it's a soft clustering. So here, because the bins overlap, uh, so do these clusters. And you can see on the left there that the orange and the, both the top, top sl slot or the top bin and the second bin, those are identical. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have not just a clustering, but a geometry on the clusters, because we're going to connect things uh, that, um, uh, that where, where the clusters overlap. And so here you see we've gotten sort of a, a rough um, picture of the, uh, of the data set. You know, here it works perfectly. It doesn't always work this perfectly, but uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's quite useful in many situations. So, and, and just to summarize here, topological modeling, oops, sorry. Topological modeling now is when, when we take a mathematical modeling, it doesn't have to always be about equations. Um, uh, you, you know, instead the output could be a graph a network or uh, it's not just visualization, uh, although it can be, of course, because you lay it out on a, 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 on a screen, but it has many capabilities, including selection, segmentation of the graph, you know, selecting subpoints with point and click methods, coloring by quantities of interest, such as revenue in, in case of a financial data set or survival in the case of a uh, medical one. Uh, it's got the ability to explain and justify, um, you know, differences between groups uh, that one has selected or between the group and background. And there are also methods for building topological features from it and also model assessment and improvement. So here is what we did. We said, look, let's, let's, let's take a neural network, a convolutional neural network. Um, uh, you know, and, and train it on MNIST. So this is a, a data set of these uh, digits zero through nine. And we built a very simplest uh, little um, uh, neural net. Um, and what we did is we said, look, we're going to take all the, um, uh, the, the weight vectors. So let me remind you, in, in that convolutional neural net, each node is connected to nine neighboring nodes in the previous layer. And so when you do that, um, you get a vector that's a nine vector, just like those image patch vectors that we said. And so what we, what we did is we treated those just the same as those image patch data had been treated. So that meant we filtered out things which didn't vary uh, very much. Um, and we, uh, we kept only the things that had a great deal of variance and then also the most frequently occurring ones. So the mapper picture of those is on there on the left. Um, you can see it. 
Um, uh, and so that's definitely, a, you know, a very nice uh, primary circle. You can even see that the, um, you know, the weight vectors, you, you know, look roughly like uh, what we had there in the primary circle. But you might say, well, what's the, this mapper thing? You know, th is it meaningful? Maybe you just sort of tuned it to get what you wanted and so forth and so on. Um, well, the, the persistent homology barcodes are there on the right, uh, where you can see um, that what we're getting, yes, the space is connected, but also there's a pretty strong signal for a circle. So that's, uh, you know, further confirmation, if you like, that this picture is the right one. Now, one of the things that I, uh, that I mentioned before that one wants to know about a neural network is how does it do its learning? So in this case, uh, here's a way of doing that. Take the, you know, after 100 iterations, 200, 400, 500, and so forth, more and more number of iterations, what is the concentration of these weight vectors? What do the map, what do the mapper outputs of those look like? And so here, what you've got is you've got some mapper pictures. Now, you'll notice that here, these mostly look like carpets, that is pure two-dimensional things. Um, uh, but we can color them by the number of points in each node. So remember, each node in mapper corresponds to a collection of data points. That means collection of these, uh, uh, of these images. And so uh, what you can see is maybe you don't always see a, a circle per se, but you certainly see that the red stuff uh, corresponds to a circle. So let me run through it. You, you'll notice in that, that top layer, the first layer, uh, you know, starts out kind of randomly. Uh, but then uh, as you move to the right, you see that the, the primary circle starts forming pretty rapidly after 200 uh, iterations, even 400 iterations, you see an honest circle with concentrations around uh, 500, though the circle starts to degrade and then it continues to degrade. And, and in fact, what it's doing is, as you can see after a thousand iterations, it's capturing something in the middle there, which is uh, kind of a black bullseye in the middle of a, you know, a less dark region. So that's a more complex feature, if you like. And what's odd here is that it's being captured at the early stages uh, in the first layer. Uh, and so anyway, it degrades. And so what you keep is you keep the four north, south, east, and west points, it turns out, on your, um, uh, on your primary circle. But then you have this thing in the middle, which needs to get captured. What's happening in the second layer then is quite interesting. You'll notice that not much is happening for the first uh, 500 iterations. But at about 500 iterations, you see that it starts to concentrate and move toward the boundary. And it's starting to create a primary circle in the second layer. And that happens essentially exactly when the first layer is starting to degrade. And so after 1,000, you can see it's more pronounced. And after 2,000, it's really quite pronounced. And so here, what's happened is that you've actually gotten you know, a counterintuitive thing, uh, which is wh where, you know, a higher order feature is captured early. That's not what happens in the, in the human visual system. It's also not what happens in a deeper network, as I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, so we believe that in this case, this is an illustration of a way of analyzing what goes on. But in this case, we believe that it's kind of anomalous, and it's probably anomalous because the network simply isn't deep enough. That is to say, it doesn't have enough layers. Um, so, um, here is a, this is weight spaces for a more complex data set, so-called CIFAR-10, uh, which has more complex objects in it, not just uh, characters or digits. And so you can see here that we get our, our uh, five-dimensional, or you know, Betty one of five. And uh, this is kind of the three-circle model appearing here. So that's, now here is a deeper, a much deeper network called VGG-16. And here you can see what happens is much more um, uh, like what one would expect. You'll notice that the first two layers are pure primary circle. And then the third layer starts to capture something which is, uh, you know, a secondary circle. And then the fourth and fifth, fifth layer is capturing a crossing, seventh layer is capturing a crossing and a bullseye. So at the higher layers, you're starting to get the more complex things. So here, when the network has more freedom to operate because it's got more, more than two layers, uh, you actually get a more uh, what you, the, the kind of expected behavior that you get that you that you were looking for. So one thing we said, well, look, let's do this from this understanding here. We see that the neural network is having to learn over and over again the edges and lines. So we're going to uh, we're going to hard code those. We're going to feed those as features uh, to a Klein bottle, the, the feature um, to a neural network. 
uh, based both on the primary circle and on the Klein bottle. So the primary circle would be the edges. So it turns out it allows both speed up and generalization. So it speeds up the learning uh, with a factor of two for MNIST, which is a simple data set, and by 3.5x with a more complicated uh, digit data set called SVHN, which is uh, you know house numbers. Um, and um, generalization, so training on MNIST and uh, evaluating the, the model on this SVHN, on the house numbers, doubles the accuracy of the standard method. So it's an interesting fact, which is kind of tells you what's going on is that with the standard neural network, if you train it so that it's a very accurate on MNIST, which is one digit, uh, digit data set, it, um, and then evaluate on SVHN, what you get is 10% accuracy, and that's 10% accuracy in a 10-way classification problem. So that, that's uh, not very good. Uh, we should show here that generalization can be improved to 22% um, uh, using these methods. Now we're going to show that you can do even better uh, in, a, in a forthcoming, in another example. Okay, so TDA and deep architectures. So um, the convolutional situation, basically here, we're saying that there is a geometry on the feature space and it's a grid geometry. And the question is, how do you use such geometries? Can you use other geometries? Um, so there are three ways, well, <clears throat> um, you, you know, but in this particular case, the discovered geometry, um, uh, as opposed to sort of a predefined one, which is the images, they come, you know, you know predefined as, as that. Um, so you can discover a geometry, which we have, you know, the Klein bottle in the primary circle, and we can use that to design architectures and also do uh, feature selection or feature engineering. And let me just talk about that briefly here, because this is something which doesn't always get talked about. I'm going to talk about feature space modeling. So given a data matrix, you can also consider it's transposed. So the rows of the transpose are the features of the data set. And, and when there are many features, you know, you can't understand them all and, uh, typically, and it's useful to create these mapper models of them, which keep track of sort of the similarity or, 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 of, of the features. So it, it compresses and recognizes correlations among the features, and each row of the original matrix gives a function on the data set, so you can actually color it by uh, color the, the model of the feature space by the data points. So here is a, we did an analysis of breast cancer, uh, you know, in the early days uh, of, the, of the TDA project. Um, and, uh, you know, here we found that there were three cohorts in this particular uh, mapper model. Cohort A um, was, uh, it was one with perfect survival. So everybody there survived the whole length of the study. Cohort B had actually re relatively poor prognosis. It includes the more complex and difficult forms of breast cancer. Cohort C was somewhere in between. And what we did here, these data sets consisted of 272 rows and 1,500 columns. Uh, the 1,500 columns correspond to genes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build a mapper model on the genes and color it by the different cohorts. And so that's what you see here. So you can see, cohort, the, the, notice the three graphs are the same. These are the models of the genes that occur in this study. Um, and uh, you can see that the good survival cohort is blue on the bottom and red on the top. Um, but you can see that the second one, the, the, the poor prognosis, has kind of that exactly flipped. And cohort C, the third one, looks like a weaker version of cohort B. It doesn't look like a weaker version of cohort A very much. And so that kind of tells you that, that cohort A is the kind of the anomalous one or something that needs, you know, something special to happen. Also notice that there, there are some genes that uh, that, that remain red within those blue cohorts. And so it might be interesting to study those. Um, now, uh, similarly, a UCSD uh, microbiome study, uh, this is, um, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, one takes samples from the human uh, gut biome and, and what one measures is the uh, bacterial uh, subpopulation. So abundances of bacterial subpopulations, about 10,000 of them. So these are models of that feature space. And what you can see is the good differences between the healthy on the left and the ulcerative colitis on the right. They look the same, except this thing right here is bright red in the ulcerative colitis and not present in the healthy. And similarly up here, um, you, you know, you have Crohn's disease. It looks the same as the healthy, except it's missing this bright red thing. So you can build now, as you can imagine, generalized convolutional neural nets. The key thing that you need is just the decomposition of a, of a vertex set into layers and then correspondences or relations 
uh, from uh, you know, the I minus first layer to the ith layer. That produces a directed computation graph and you can work with it. And so what one might think about here is building an architecture based on the Klein bottle findings that would look something where the connections would look something like this. We've experimented with this to put it into the higher layers. It's still uh, you know, not so uh, obvious how, what the improvement is because, it, because ultimately this is gonna teach you things that are obtained by kind of varying within the Klein bottle. The Klein bottle itself deals with first and second derivatives. So you get higher order derivatives when you do this. However, feeding the features into the first layer uh, is, 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 is very, uh, it improves things a great deal. So here I should, and now I'm gonna summarize some of the results with topological neural nets uh, that are jointly done with my co-authors here. So, so this is generalization. So we took MNIST and we, say we added some Gaussian noise to it. Um, <clears throat> and then we said, well, let's train on the, on the, on the, the noisy data set and evaluate on the clean and let's do the other. And so what you see here is an ordinary convolutional neural net in both cases across the top here, where you're training on the MNIST or you're evaluating on the MNIST. Um, <clears throat> sorry, on the noisy. Sorry, you're, you're, in this case, you're training on the noisy. In this case, you're evaluating the noisy training on the clean. And what you see here is that, uh, you, you know, the, the, the blue uh, line is uh, ordinary convolutional neural nets. And the other four are various forms of these Klein or primary circle features. And so you can see that the generalization, you know, actually doesn't occur at all for the ordinary neural net, but it is accomplished using this, uh, the, the MNIST, uh, well, using the Klein features. And in particular, the, 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 the Klein features are the orange and green. As you can see, they get to an accurate, rapid, uh, rapidly get to an accuracy. To, uh, whereas the primary circle, uh, those are the purple and the red. Um, you know, those don't get there as quickly. You also might remark that, in fact, you're seeing that it's starting to degrade a little bit uh, after you get to your optimum there. And that's a standard thing that one finds with neural networks. You start to lapse into kind of overfitting and, and your, your measure of accuracy, which accounts for overfitting, uh, is, is seeing that. So in any case, you can see here, in both cases, you really are able to do much better generalization. And uh, similarly, we can take the example we saw before, the MNIST, the SVHN uh, generalizability, where you, you, know, you, you train on, say, SVHN and go and, and evaluate on MNIST or vice versa. And in this case, we're getting accuracies. This is a much harder problem, by the way, but here in this SVHN to MNIST, we're getting to 50%. And um, secondly, when you train on MNIST to get to SVHN, here we're getting up to something like 35% instead of 22%. So there's a great deal of improvement here in this kind of problem as well. So this is, this is different. That previous generalization was taking a given data set and adding noise to it. This is taking one data set and you know, going to an entirely different data set. And once again, you can see that, 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 that the convolutional neural net uh, doesn't do anything in that regard. That's the, 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 those two at the bottom are the two NOLs here, which are the, uh, the, the ordinary convolutional neural nets another version of this. And here are the learning rates or the learning uh, speeds. And what you can see here is that for, there's always improvement, but it's not, you know, that dramatic here. Actually, you know, this has something to do with the scaling here. It actually is reasonably um, compelling because you get to, to a, a high degree of accuracy very rapidly here, but then everybody gets to the same place quick, relatively quickly. For SVHN, which is a more complicated data set, you can see they, the, the results are much stronger. Uh, these are the, the, this, in this case, this kind of pink and, and red are the ones that we're, that we're talking about. And then finally down here at the bottom, a USPS, which is a smaller data set of images uh, of, of digits, uh, 16 by 16. Um, and uh, there too, you know, you're, you're getting improved learning. And finally, um, let, me, let me give, two or three minutes to discussing video. So video is a much harder problem than static images as, as you would expect. Um, and the question is, well, what's the model to use here? You don't have you're just your client features there for static features, but there's a leap of faith that you can make here. And the leap of faith says, well, I believe that for static images, you know, the client bottle is, is, is a good gadget to look at. Um, but so what should video be? Well, video should be movements within that. So it should be uh, something like the tangent bundle to the Klein bottle. 
And so what we said here is, look, let's take the, the, the new model here, uh, or the new geometry on this feature space, is the tangent bundle to the Klein bottle suitably parameterized? And because that is a, that's actually the, the, the thing that we built was actually kind of six dimensional there, we had to include some stuff for translation. Um, we had to select subparts of it. So if you can imagine within that Klein bottle, you, you might choose to select only the primary circle and then a few couple of secondary circles to, to evaluate on if you want to do smaller calculation. And in this case here, there are some natural uh, circles coming from rotations and translations and so on that we used. But the main thing was that we we then evaluated this uh, work, used this on the University of Central Florida video classification data set which includes humans doing various kinds of tasks and movements and so on. And uh, what we got, uh, you know, in this case, we plugged in these uh, client features into a 12 layer ResNet. So this is a fairly deep network and it's a particular an architecture of a particular kind. And uh, I compared it straight up with a, a normal network. And you can see that what we get here is, you know, dramatically better. Um, you, you know, you get rapidly to a 0.7, uh, 70% accuracy. Uh, whereas the ordinary layer gets seems to be stabilizing at around 50% accuracy. Now, what's interesting about this is that many people have kind of worked on this data set, but what the way that what they typically do is they say, actually, we're going to try to predict on this data set, but we're going to introduce a lot of features from outside the data set. And we're going to do that by training on a much, much larger collection of images. So they train on other images to get to uh, you know, some features which eventually allow them to predict on, uh, you know, on this data set and, and, and do quite well. But the trouble is that you've used a lot of those, you, you, you've, you've trained, you've required a lot of data to train on it uh, to get there. Uh, and that's one of the banes, if you like, of, uh, for, for deep learning, uh, the fact that it requires so much data to train. And so in this case, we are training just on what we have in this data set and getting to this 70% uh, accuracy. Okay, so I want to end by talking a little bit about um, uh, a paper by Gary Marcus. So Gary Marcus was head of AI at uh, Uber and is now back in academia, and uh, I think he's doing a company as well. Um, but he wrote basically a friendly critique of deep learning, and he said, uh, you know, it's deep learning is data hungry. It requires too much data. It has trouble working with prior knowledge. So uh, it, it says, look, uh, how do I embed the fact that maybe I understand some physics about a problem I have or whatever, how do I embed that in there? It's difficult. It has trouble with generalization and adversarial examples as we've, as we've seen. And he summarizes all this in saying that it cannot be engineered. And what he means by engineered is that, you know, there aren't sort of systematic things that you can do where you gradually and iteratively, um, you know, improve uh, the performance of your neural net because we don't, understand what's going on in there. So at the moment, it is more people trying one idea or another and kind of throwing it up against the wall and see what, what works. Um, and so the hope is that the kind of methods that I'm talking about here allow us to understand better what's going on and ultimately try to engineer in a better way uh, the, the, the neural network uh, models. And so with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention and take questions. Thank you. Uh, let me... Uh, I suggest we unmute ourselves and thank Guna for this wonderful talk. Any other questions? So my, my, maybe I have a question. Uh, so Gunnar, you use the fact that we understand uh, the data set of, uh, let's say three of some patches of images, uh, right? We understand it well with this Klein bottle, with these, uh, with these um, yeah. primary and secondary circles, et cetera. Do we have, is there any other type of data set where we have a similar understanding of, uh, of, of their geometry? Well, I, I would say that now after the fact, we understand it for video. But the, the nice thing is that we didn't have to do a statistical analysis. We could go the other way. We could say, 
let's take that leap of faith because we kind of look at the Klein bottle and it looks to us like this, the, the, um, um, that we should be using the motions within that. So we should use the, the tangent bundle. And there are similar things. So for 3D imaging, there is an analog of the Klein bottle. It's a three manifold, um, you, you know, kind of an, an analog of, of the Klein bottle. And then there's also for 3D video, so all of those things are situations where there's a very natural geometry that, that, that one can use. And those 3D things are quite interesting from the point of view of uh, fMRI, for example, uh, brain imaging, which is often, uh, you, you know, voxel. Yeah. What, what I would say is also, I mean, of course, for the individual data sets, I showed uh, for the breast cancer one, a data set of genes uh, that, that, that you know, right. showed what structure it has relative to breast cancer. And similarly in that gut biome example. So, you know, all those things uh, are sort of mapper models of feature spaces. And I would regard each of those as say giving, you know, some level of understanding. Okay. Um, but of course, in, in those cases, it's not as sort of, you know, mathematically clean as it would be in the image case. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And Guna, there is another question from chatting. Okay. Uh, yeah. can, can the hidden layers be topologically any manifold? I'm sorry, can the hidden layer what? Uh, can the hidden layers be topologically any manifold? That's- uh, Oh, I see, I see, I understand. Yeah, in principle, you could make it any, any manifold. You don't want to get anything too high dimensional. Again, you're going to run, you're going to have to, too many nodes and the computations are not going to work well. But but yeah, that's kind of the philosophy here that you want to make it be any manifold or not necessarily even a manifold, but you know a simplicial complex or, or something along those lines, and where you 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 make you sparsify your connections using the geometry of that complex. Uh, to just to follow up this question, uh, is it that uh, the geometry of the layers are similar to the geometry of whatever object you are trying to look at? I'm sorry. They, so, you know, it's 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 like this. And if I understand your question right, it's like if you imagine that you have data that's being gathered by a bunch of sensors, and if you understand the correlations among the sensors, you have a geometry there. Then it is that it should be the geometry of that you, you know of that sensor space. So if you've got sensors arranged in a circle, it would be a circle but maybe they're arranged in some other some some other way maybe they're in three dimensions and they might be on a sphere and so on did, did i get your question right i didn't i didn't quite hear it maybe if you could say it again sort of so it's like uh the data sources so uh based on how the uh, how we're getting the data on that basis we're sort of designing these layers Yes, that's correct. That, that's correct. So we're using some understanding of the uh, of, uh, of the of the data sources um, and the geometry of those. So which aspects of the data source are sort of very similar or correlated to to other ones, and using that process to do feature engineering. So an interesting other situation would be text, um, where you know you could you could use, for example, a coordinatization, which is just uh, one hot encoding for the words. Um, and, and so, you know, you would have a big, uh, you know, if there are, you know, say 500,000 or a million words in your dictionary, you would have that many features, but you could impose a geometry on that uh, from something like a thesaurus, uh, where you say, look, this word is, you know, is a variant of this other word. And so you could impose that geometry and use that for your feature engineering. Now, what, what's being done is, People are saying, actually, I'm going to build some vector models, vector space models, vector embeddings of the words with much lower dimension. So maybe three, four, 500 using something like word to vec uh, as you, you may be familiar with. And so that you know, is, a, is another approach. I think we don't fully understand what happens there. It's built entirely out of context information. So which words occur together with which other words. And uh, so, what would be very interesting is to attempt to gain more insight into those word to vec kind of models by maybe using mapper as I described it uh, on that feature space. Um, did, did that get to your question? Yeah. So that means that maybe we could learn the context as a graph or something like that. Correct. Correct. Uh, yes, exactly. That we kind of view a graph as being a good way of encoding uh, all the context or what's happening, the, the context among the features. Yeah. Well, wow, nice. Thank you. Thank you.
Any other questions? Sorry, yes, uh, just a quick question. Um, without knowing much, I I'm just asking for context. Professor Carlson, you gave a talk, I remember, back in November, a few months, I think four months ago. I'm curious, was anything new in this talk? Or Anything new and well, you know, this work is from before from before November. So uh, I don't know which talk you heard, but no, this is a this is a, very much similar to there. I give a talk to different audiences because not everybody sees every talk. Well, what I will say, I, I will say, though, that, that what I mentioned is the, the learnings that we've had. One learning is that there is an analogy between building the neural networks say with the higher layers, the connections in the higher layers being the, the local in the Klein bottle thing, that if you do that all by itself, you only build those layers, which are sort of Klein bottle layers, you restrict the neural network too much. So it, it, it's, it's probably like, you know, you should think of the Klein bottle as kind of some part of linear plus 2D or plus degree two. And then the next one should be something like degree three and D4 stuff so that you need to include them all into each other. Um, um, so, so, you know, that is sort of a, that is sort of a new finding. We want to remember that when we perform these restrictions, sometimes uh, there are too, there are too many and we want to allow enough freedom to learn as well. Okay, maybe one more. Uh, if not, uh, let me stop the recording and thank you, Gunnar Carlson, again. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much.